Hello everyone and welcome to another Let's Play of A Little Lily Princess by Hanukkah Games. My name is Anna Mardal. Um, today we are going to be finishing, I hope, <laughs> fingers crossed, the Jesse walkthrough. Um, as you recall, because you probably came here straight from the last video in the playlist, um, we were in Act 2, our father has died, everything is horrible, and um, we're trying to get the ending with Jesse. And I feel actually really bad because I feel like my commentary on the last episode was, I feel like it was awful because I got so sucked into the story that like, I was just reading and not talking about the content because it was so good. Um, so <laughs> hopefully this time will be better. Who knows? We'll find out. Um, so Sarah is practicing the Latin book that Miss Minton gave her. Quintus Vivius Est. Sarah sat alone in her attic room practicing the vocabulary from the Latin book she had been given. Metella, meter, pueri est. She could scarcely hear her own voice over the rattling of rain on the slate roof. The sound of droplets surged and danced in waves, seeming to form words she could almost understand. I cannot concentrate. She set the book on the thin mattress and looked up at the blurred, shifting images through the wet skylight. If she stood on her bed and looked out the skylight when it was not dark or rainy, she could see the attic window of the house next to Miss Minchin's seminary. However, that window was always dark and empty. The house was vacant. I wish someone would move into that house. Suppose that one moment, that one morning, I looked out and saw that window propped open and a head and shoulders framed within it. If it looked a nice head, I might begin by saying good morning, and then all sorts of things might happen. Of course, it's not really likely that anyone but underservants would sleep in an attic. Sarah looked round at the dirty and dark environment that had become her living space. All around, the world was gray, the few spots of color, the old red footstool, the book cover, Emily's hair, were like fish in muddy water, glimpse for moments and then fading away. This is the best I can look forward to for the rest of my life, to have books when Miss Minchin decides I am worthy of them. When I am older, she will make me a teacher, but she will never pay me. There will always be more debt. She will be obliged to give me respectable clothes for the school's sake, but they will still be plain and ugly and make it clear that I am a servant and I will never escape. Then a thought came back to her, which made the color rise in her cheek and a spark light itself in her eyes. She straightened her thin little body and lifted her head. Whatever comes cannot alter one thing. If I am a princess in rags and tatters, I can still be a princess in sigh. It would be easy to be a princess if I were dressed in cloth of gold, but it is a great deal more of a triumph to be one all the time when no one knows it. Marie Antoinette, when she was in prison and her throne was gone, and she had only a black gown and her hair was white, and they insulted her and called her Widow Capet. She was a great deal more like a queen then than when she was so gay and everything around her was so grand. I like her best then. Those howling mobs of people did not frighten her. She was stronger than they were, even when they cut off her head. Nothing that I am facing is as frightening as that. I'm gonna cry again. I, I don't know what we need for, for Jessie's, I should be taking notes or something. Um, let's just stick with our clothes washing plan. Cause I, we need pride, I bet. There's no pride, we didn't get a, we did not get a single pride. I don't know if I'm gonna come back for pride. Sarah, Lavinia tells me that you have left the window in her room quite open all day long. Did I? I don't think I did. But it doesn't matter. I'm sorry, Miss Minchin. It was an accident. Have you no thought for the weather? If it begins to rain, many of her belongings could be damaged, you stupid girl. You don't know that you are saying these things to a princess and that if I chose I could wave my hand and order you to execution. Yes, I'm sorry. 
I had better go and check that all the other windows are closed properly. I only spare you because I am a princess, and you are a poor, stupid, unkind, vulgar old thing, and you don't know any better. Please excuse me, cook. A princess must be polite. Sarah bobbed gently and walked out of the room. That girl, to smile as if she hadn't even been scolded. Sometimes I cannot tell whether she hears me at all. It's as if she were living in another world. She's got more airs and graces than if she came from Buckingham Palace, that one. She drops them out the kitchen as if they were nothing. It is not a natural way for a child who has lost her only parent to behave. She is a clever girl, and that is why she is useful. But it may also turn her sly. I won't have her plotting mischief. Keep her busy. If she's tired enough, she will have no time to put to ill purposes. Okay, hunger, we do, we have that. Sarah was hard at work scrubbing potatoes when she became aware of a disruption in the kitchen. I do beg your pardon, miss. Miss? It was Jessie, stepping into the kitchen on her toes as if she were carefully picking a path through a nest of worms. I require Sarah's services. Send her to my room at once. Why is she mimicking Lavinia? Jessie withdrew from the kitchens without waiting for an acknowledgement. Reckon you'd better get on then. You'll just have to work twice as fast when you get back. If this was Jessie's idea of finding me a respite from my chores, I am not so sure that it helps. However, when she arrived at Jessie's room, it became apparent that this was not a friendly encounter. Take a brush and straighten my hair. Make it look good. You must have learned something from that French maid of yours. It must look beautiful. Well, get to it. Confused, Sarah took up the brush and began to run it slowly through the long red hair as she had seen Jessie do before. Jessie frowned at herself in the dressing table mirror. I wish I had some creme celeste for my skin. I can't use rouge, obviously, that's vulgar. I shouldn't even pinch my cheeks, not with this horrible hair. If only I were blonde. Should I soot my lashes? They'd look so much better dark, but I don't want to get dirt in my eyes or on my skin. What do you think? I? I have never heard of anyone putting soot on her eyelashes. Why would Jessie ask my opinion of such a thing? I don't think it's a good idea, as you said. Don't tell me what I said! Is she having a fit of temper? Of course, you were born with beautiful eyelashes. They're so long and thick, but mine. All of a sudden, she leaned forward and buried her face in her arms, forcing Sarah to move quickly to avoid yanking on her hair. Oh, this is hopeless. I don't think it's me that she's angry at. What is happening? Why are you so agitated? A pained whimper was her first response. After a moment she spoke, her words still muffled in her arms. My parents are coming. They have sent me a message. She raised her head, her cheeks now flushed a dangerous pink, and lifted her chin very much in the way that Sarah would imagine a soldier facing a firing squad. I am to primp and doll myself up in the best style so they can take me to meet a wealthy gentleman of their acquaintance, someone who they think might make a marriage prospect. Marriage? But you are only a schoolgirl. You're far too young. Sarah caught herself as she spoke. She was no longer in a position to criticize anyone's parents. This girl who had so imperiously demanded her services might order her beaten for impertinence. Jessie, it would seem, took no offense. Her reply was quiet and resigned. Not too young to be engaged. Not even too young to marry, if my parents wish it. A girl as young as twelve may become a bride. That's the law. She ran her hands over her forehead, pressing down along her cheeks. What do I do? I'm not prepared. I'm not polished. I'm not finished yet. Perhaps that is what you should tell them, that you are not ready. 
How can I deny them now, if they have already made their plans, if they may at this moment be en route? I must go. My parents have commanded it. I can't refuse. But what is it that you want? I... Her lip caught between her teeth as she took a nervous breath. I do not want to embarrass myself. I must look beautiful, Sarah. What do I do? Don't you have any ideas? Perhaps Lavinia. I don't want Lavinia. I want you. Does she mean that? Or is it only that I, as a servant, cannot turn her away? I don't know anything about being beautiful. Jessie's face twisted in dismay. Please, Sarah, please help me. With this hair, they will look at me and laugh. I can't face it. I shall break down in tears, and then I will be even uglier. The more I worry about weeping, the more I am certain it will happen. I don't completely understand, but the most important thing is to make her feel calm before she goes into hysterics. If your hair were really so dreadful as all that, your parents would not want you to grow it long and make it so visible, would they? Jessie pouted, looking almost as sulky as Lottie, but thankfully a Lottie who was not yet in tears. It's unfashionable. It is different. You told me once that just because someone was not beautiful in the way that a doll is beautiful, that doesn't mean she isn't pretty. Your hair makes you unique. Even if someone else has grown it so long, who else would have this color? You are not the same as other beauties. You are rare and special. Someone who appreciates your beauty will appreciate it even more because it is rare, won't they? Jessie turned in her seat, the fear and strain melting away from her face. Do you really think I'm beautiful? Sarah considered that for a moment. It was not in her nature to lie outright, although neither would she choose to deliver a blunt insult unless strongly provoked. Is Jessie beautiful? She is certainly more like a doll than I am, but it is the ways in which she is not like a doll that make her prettiest. I think you are very pleasing to look at. Oh, Sarah, you don't know how I've hoped to hear you say that. She turned back to her mirror and frowned. But if you do appreciate my looks, it would make me feel better to know that you had made some suggestion to improve them. If I don't come up with something, we may be here all day. Well... I think I have seen paintings of fairies with hair like yours, worn long and loose and wavy and swept back with a circlet of flowers or butterflies. That's what Mariette wanted to do to my hair once. She wanted to make a crown of roses. Oh, oh, that's beautiful, Sarah. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath as if drawing in the scent of roses. I would like to wear a crown of roses. To be like a warrior queen of old, beautiful and strong? If your parents are coming today, I don't have time to find flowers for you now. Perhaps not, but it is still a lovely thought. With the aid of the mirror, she reached up behind her and caught Sarah's hand. Thank you for thinking of me. I don't want her to marry. One afternoon, there came a familiar tapping at Sarah's door. She knew by the sound that it was Becky. But Becky was too excited to wait for a response and burst into the room only moments after knocking. Can we see it from your window? See what? There's a van and horses and men with furniture. Do you mean the house next door? Together, they scrambled up onto Sarah's thin mattress and craned their heads to see the road outside. Sarah could just make out men in shirt sleeves carrying heavy packages and furniture, though she could not see the entrance they walked through. Still, there was only one house she knew to be vacant so close. It's taken! It really is taken! Oh, I do hope a nice head will look out the attic window. Wish we could go down and see up close, but Cook would have our backs for idling. 
Oh, Becky, look, look! Glimpsed for a moment were items that made Sarah's heart give a quick beat of recognition. There was a beautiful table of elaborately wrought teakwood and some chairs and a screen covered with rich oriental embroidery. They look so much like the things I used to see when I lived in India with my papa. Do you remember my carved teakwood desk, Becky? Miss Minchin took it away to be sold. Don't know what's teakwood, miss, but know you had a pretty desk. Sometimes it's hard to remember from up here what it was like in India. It is like a dream slipping from my fingers. Look now, there are patterned rugs. I thought I may never see such things again. Miss, an idol. The workers now had a Buddha in a splendid shrine. Someone in the family must have been in India. They have got used to Indian things and like having them around. I am glad. I shall feel as if they were friends, even if a head never looks out of the attic window. Becky's mind was still caught by the sight of the Buddha. And even living next door, kneeling down and praying to gold and stone. Reckon somebody ought to send him a tract. You can get a tract for a penny. Sarah laughed a little. I don't believe they worship that idol. Some people keep them because to look at because they are interesting. My papa had a beautiful one, and he did not worship it. More romantic if it's Ethan's, don't you think, miss? I never lived next door to no Ethan's. I should like to see what sort of ways they'd have. People aren't so different, really, when you look at them closely enough. I'm sure we'll find out more about our new neighbors soon. They're only just next door, after all. I, I wish I knew in advance what I needed for the Jesse stuff. Because there's no way to tell. Okay, we got some pride though. That seems good. Sarah was in the schoolroom with her small pupils. Having finished giving them their lessons, she was now gathering the French exercise books together. As she did so, she thought, as she often did, about the various things that royal personages in disguise had found themselves forced to do. Alfred the Great, for example, had wandered England like a peasant to hide from the invading Danes, begging for food in exchange for stores. Once he had been promised cakes by a farm wife if he had watched the stove while she herded the cows, but he was distracted thinking about his problems, and the cakes burned, and the farm wife boxed his ears. She had no idea he was anything but a poor beggar. How frightened she must have been when she learned what she had done. Sarah saw Miss Minchin enter the room to check on the progress of the older students. She lowered her gaze and smiled to herself. Imagine if she should find out that I, Sarah, with my toes almost sticking out of my worn old shoes, am truly a princess. She did not realize how this expression might look to the older woman like a sly little smirk. You. All at once, Miss Vinchin flew at Sarah, pinching her ear and giving it a shake. It was so very like the way that Alfred's ears had been boxed that Sarah, startled out of her dreams, could not help but give a little laugh. It was not planned, but simply burst out of her. What are you laughing at, you bold, impudent child? It took Sarah a few seconds to control herself sufficiently to remember that she was a princess. I was thinking, beg my pardon at once. Sarah hesitated a second before she replied. I will beg your pardon for laughing if it was rude. But I won't beg your pardon for thinking. What were you thinking? How dare you? That exclamation caused a wave of quiet titters among the older students. Look at Sarah. She's not even frightened. She's about to say something queer. I'm sure of it. I was thinking that you did not know what you were doing. That I did not know what I was doing? I was thinking about what would happen if I were a princess, what I should do to you. And I was thinking that if I were one, 
you would never dare to do it, whatever I said or did. And I was thinking how surprised and frightened you would be if you suddenly found out that I really was a princess and could do anything, anything I liked. Every pair of eyes in the room widened to its full limit. Lavinia leaned forward on her seat to look. Miss Minchin's hand flashed, and Sarah's cheek glowed red. Go to your room this instant. Leave this schoolroom. And you, young ladies, attend to your lessons. Sarah made a little bow. Excuse me for laughing if it was impolite. And she walked out of the room, leaving Miss Minchin struggling for words. Did you see that? How very odd she looked. Her eyes were glittering like a wild beast. I shouldn't be at all surprised if she did turn out to be something. Suppose she should. Sarah's back was aching. Her hands felt rough and sore, and the bucket of coals she carried impossibly heavy. Because of that, it took her a while to hear the sound, even though it was one that was all too familiar. The sound of a girl crying. That's coming from Jessie's room. I shouldn't care. I have my own troubles. What has Jessie ever done for me? She sees my suffering, and she thinks only of herself. If I ignore her now, though, I am doing the same thing. She dared not set down the bucket of coals anywhere but a hearth. Leaving it outside would signal to anyone who passed that she was shirking her duties, and might leave marks that would require more cleaning later. Struggling to keep everything in place, she knocked on Jessie's door. Jessie, it's Sarah. Are you all right? Sarah, C come in. Inside the bedroom, Sarah found Jessie curled up in her bed, her nose and eyes red with marks of prolonged weeping. Sarah set the coals by Jessie's fire and stepped a little closer. Why are you crying? My parents. Did something happen to them? Is she an orphan too? Could that fate strike another so quickly? Oh, Sarah, I'm so frightened. I'm not sure they're going to bring me out at all. I may never see a ballroom. What? I thought they would at least wait and let me have my debut. But now it sounds like they'll give me to the very first man willing to pay for my hand. So they have not died. Sell me like a doll or a horse. I always knew what they wanted, but I thought, as long as there was time, that there was still chance. I might meet someone special. Your true love, the prince who would find you in the ballroom. Not a prince. Her voice and her eyes both lowered to the pillow in her lap. I don't know if you can understand this, Sarah, but I don't care for men. Yes, I knew it. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. Sorry. Especially Mr. Watney, my parents' friend. The way he looks at me. It's like he believes all those horrible things they say about women with red hair, and he's glad about it. Just thinking about being married to someone like that makes me feel so dirty and ashamed. By now her tears had run dry. Jessie rubbed her palms over her knees, smoothing the fabric of her gown. I wanted so much to live with Lavinia forever to dance with her and be her companion. But she doesn't understand my feelings at all. She was horrid. And I wanted to be with you, but... Jessie's lips trembled. She struggled to put on a smiling face. I'm sorry. I shouldn't cry so. I'll ruin my complexion. It is my duty to be beautiful. She lay back, resting her cheek upon a pillow, and exhaled slowly. I'm sorry, Sarah. 
Being married must not sound so terrible compared to what happened to you. At least my future husband will protect me from such a fate. Sarah thought of Miss Minchin. Protection is not always kindness. Lavinia's protection is not always kindness either. Jessie rolled over and extended a hand to Sarah. Come and sit with me. I'll get your bed dirty. I don't mind. Please? I should go. I shouldn't risk it, but... Against her better judgment, Sarah sat on the edge of the bed and took Jessie's hand in hers. I have always been a silly girl. When I first came to this school, I was so weak. I cried and sniffled all the time. I hated being like that, but I couldn't stop myself. Lavinia was everything I wanted to be. Her parents were well off, and she was elegant, fierce, never afraid. She had polished manners. She knew all her letters and verses. She was perfect. I wanted to be her. I followed her around like a cat, learning her every movement. When she noticed me, I thought she would be angry. But then she allowed me to be her friend, and I couldn't believe my good fortune. When I was with her, I didn't have to be weak and afraid anymore, because I knew that Lavinia was stronger and smarter and simply better than everyone else. All I wanted was to please her. She looked down at Sarah's hand. Timidly, her fingers tightened. My parents could not send me extra clothes or pocket money. They had only enough to keep me here. I had enough, but not more. Anything else I borrowed from Lavinia. She didn't seem to mind. She wanted her best friend to look respectable. And I imagined that when we were old enough, she would declare that she wished me for her companion, and I would never have to marry. It wasn't until you came to Miss Minchin's that I realized how little Lavinia thought of me. All those years that we were best friends, and I never knew she was born in India. She never told me anything that mattered. Jessie's smile was as beautiful and hollow as any doll. It doesn't matter anyway. Even if she despises me, I'd rather belong to her than to Mr. Watney. But that won't matter, will it? She won't help me, and I can't help you. She let go of Sarah's hand then. I'm sorry. I'm selfish and silly. If I were Lavinia and someone found you in here with me, I could protect you. But I'm not Lavinia. No. You're not. Oh, Jessie, I never knew. I have to go. I know. <sighs> it was Sarah, not Becky, who first caught sight of the man who had purchased the house next door. The day was wet with the unpleasant aftermath of the wrong amount of rain, enough to turn the dirt to mud and trash to sludge, but not enough to wash the sto street stones clean. Sarah had to be careful to mind her steps, or else she might wind up falling into filth. As she picked her way back to the seminary, she saw a carriage pull up and stop before the newly occupied house. Once upon a time, sorry, one at a time, the entourage unfurled. First a footman, then a gentleman whom Sarah thought she had seen around London before. Next, a nurse in uniform, and then two large manservants coming around to assist their master. Not the familiar gentleman, but a man with a haggard, distressed face and a skeletal body wrapped in furs. He was carried up the steps, and the other gentleman followed behind him, looking anxious. Sarah could not safely linger any longer to watch. The last thing she saw before heading back into Miss Minchin's seminary was the arrival of a doctor's carriage. Inside, Becky caught her to share the gossip. Er, the gentleman next door is yellow, miss. Could he be Chin Chinese and not from India? No, he's not Chinese. He's very ill. I hope it ends better for him. 
than it did for my papa. Oh, miss. Please, I would rather be alone right now. Yes, miss. But I would not rather be alone. I would rather that my papa were here. Or even that I were back in my old rooms and Mariette were there. She picked up Emily and ran a hand over the doll's hair. You are all that I have. She set the doll back on a chair and perched her own thin form on the red footstool, gazing into Emily's glassy eyes. One of Sarah's supposings was that Emily might be a kind of good witch who could protect her. Sometimes, after she had stared at her until she was wrought up to the highest pitch of fancifulness, she would ask her questions and find herself almost believing that Emily might answer. But Emily never did. Well, I don't answer people who speak to me very often either. I never answer when I can help it. When people are insulting you, there is nothing so good as not to say a word, just to look at them and think. Miss Minchin turned pale with rage when I do it, and the girls look frightened. When you will not fly into a passion, people know that you are stronger than they are, and they say stupid things they wish they hadn't said afterward. It's a good thing not to answer your enemies. Perhaps Emily is more like me than I am like myself. Perhaps she would rather not answer her friends either. She keeps it all in her heart. But though she tried to satisfy herself with these arguments, she did not find it easy. Oh, my heart is broken and I, I kind of... I just wish I knew how long this was. We're on week 31. Did somebody say they went to week 32? We'll go a little farther. If I go too long, my, my voice will, will honestly break and that would be bad. Um, I have no idea what we're going to need for Jesse. When Sarah stumbled to the attic that night, her slim legs shook with exhaustion. She could not even reach the comfort of the red footstool before her knees gave out. It had been a terrible day. She had been sent out in the cold time and again, no one choosing to remember that she was only a child, that she was not strong, and that her small body might be chilled and fragile. Cook's words had been vulgar and insolent. The girls had sneered amongst themselves at Sarah's shabbiness. Oh, Emily, some men laughed at me because my old shoes made me slip down in the mud. I'm covered with mud now, and they laughed. And because I could not find the thing that Cook sent me for, they would not give me any supper. I'm so hungry. Can you hear me, Emily? I'm hungry, and I'm cold, and I'm tired. Why won't you say something? Anything? There is nobody but you to care for me, no one in all the world. She looked at the staring glass eyes and complacent face, and suddenly a sort of heartbroken rage seized her. She lifted her little savage hand and with one sweep knocked Emily off her chair. You are nothing but a doll. Nothing but a doll. 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 You care for nothing. You are stuffed with sawdust. You never had a heart. Nothing could ever make you feel you are a doll. Sarah hid her face in her arms and burst into a passion of sobbing. Sarah, who almost never cried. Emily lay on the floor, with her legs ignominiously doubled up over her head, but her face remained calm, even dignified. Sarah's sobs gradually quieted themselves. After a while, she raised her face and looked at Emily, who seemed from this angle to be gazing at her with a kind of glassy-eyed sympathy. Oh, Emily, you can't help being a doll. Not any more than Ermengarde can help being plump, or Lavinia and Jessie can help not having any sense. We are not all made alike. Sarah picked up Emily and kissed her, then shook her clothes straight and put her back upon her chair. Perhaps you do your sawdust best. I must do my best as well.
going about her duties. Sarah was distracted by the sound of an angry voice from the next room. Foolish and disgraceful. While she had become sadly accustomed to receiving the sharp end of Miss Minchin's tongue, or to hear poor Becky take a verbal drubbing, it was not common to hear a quality student scolded so. Sarah paused to peer through the crack of the door. You are sheltered from the realities of the world, as a young lady should be. Do not think for a moment that such a life would be one whit as comfortable as that which you have now. Those women may look elegant to you at a distance, but if you were to see them up close, they would be nothing but pox scars and paints. The chorus girls are paid a pittance, and lucky if they last the winter between pneumonia and not enough to eat. But a ballerina... Do not, do you think any company would put you in front with your hair? Be grateful they would not. Those stages are gaslit. The lights that look so soft and romantic, and the skirts you admire for being light and long. Do you know how many ballerinas have died screaming when those skirts caught fire? Burned alive in your ballet slippers. How grotesque. Oh, Flavie, don't be horrid. That is not appropriate hearing for a young lady, but allowances must be made to prevent these ideas of yours from taking root any further. It is well known how a ballet girl makes her living. Rich men attend those shows for a glimpse of a girl's legs as she spins and turns. And after the performance, those patrons proceed into the ballet dressing rooms to make their choices for the rest of the evening's entertainment. Jessie flinched, clearly understanding the implications. The ballet is a nest of street rats who are no better than they should be. It is no place for a lady, nor any girl who has ever pretended to be one. Even to consider such a future would have you branded an adventurous, and if you were trained for such a life here, this school would be marked as a house of ill repute. I, I only wished... You are a foolish and impractical dreamer, but you are not a wicked girl. Your mistake was made in ignorance. It has now been corrected. Never mention such a thing again. Sarah quickly turned to her work as Miss Minchin's sharp heels clattered toward the door. In the room behind, she could still hear Lavinia chiding her friend. Dear Jessie, you are such a rattlebrain. Yes, I know. The dull, defeated tone of Jessie's voice was unsettling. You should thank me. Imagine what might have happened to you if I hadn't told Miss Minchin about your silly little idea. Yes, it was very dear of you. Lavinia is probably right. It would have been a bad idea for Jessie to give up her education to try to join the ballet but she could have been kinder in the way that she did it. Sarah moved into the room to continue her dusting, expecting that the pair of friends would likely move on. Lavinia, it seemed, had other ideas. Speaking of people with ridiculous dreams... Oh, I'm sorry, my mistake. I thought I saw a girl who used to have her head in the clouds and tell lies much bigger than herself. Don't you ever get tired of listening to yourself talk? But I see now that it is only a servant. That isn't funny. What was that? I said, that isn't funny. It wasn't funny or clever the first time you said it, and it isn't any more funny or clever now. I don't think I'm hearing you correctly. Are you criticizing me, Jesse Abbott? Me? Your only hope? No. Oh, how I would like to criticize her. I would like to say, Lavinia, you are a bully, and pull her hair and slap her face and cover her dress in soot. Sarah froze, ashamed at the depths of her own dislike. Or perhaps I should call you Mrs. Watney. Please don't. She knows. Lavinia knows how Jessie feels about her possible engagement, and she treats her like that. Then come with me and do as you are told. Even if you are silly, 
I may be able to find some use for you. Thank you, Lavi. And with that, they left the room. Sarah stood there, a cleaning rag in her hands, but for long minutes she could not bring herself to carry on. It's not fair. It's not right. But there's nothing I can do. This game is tearing my heart open. Sarah lay in her little bed. The skylight covered her with the gray light of morning, but there was no warmth in it. No warmth either in the unlit fire, and very little to be found in the old blanket. Perhaps I will freeze in place some night, lying here, like Snow White in her crystal coffin. But what prince would find me here alone in an attic to wake me from my slumber? I do not even have dwarves to tend me. Fairy tale princess, princesses are often rescued by princes, but it is not so much the case for true princesses and queens. Mary, Queen of Scots, had to ride her own horses and raise her own army for her escape. She was very brave. They caught her again, and in the end she was executed, just like Marie Antoinette. I think it is very noble to be a queen who must carry on, even when she is sad or afraid. More noble than a princess who sleeps and waits to be saved. I have to carry on. That means first I must rise from my bed. Another day of work stretched before her, with no rescue in sight. Um, I'm going to try to raise pain. That's a strange thing to say, isn't it? I'm going to try to get more pain. There were fine sunsets, even in London, sometimes. But most people could only see parts of them between chimneys and over the roofs. Down in the kitchen, one could not see them at all, and could only guess they were happening because the bricks looked warmer, the air rosy or yellow for a while. From the bedrooms of the boarding students, the views were only slightly better. Perhaps one might see a blazing glow as it struck a pane of glass on a nearby window, but there was so much more to be seen. Piles of red or gold clouds in the west, or the purple ones edged with dazzling brightness or the little fleecy floaty ones tinged with rose color and looking like flights of pink doves scurrying across the blue in a great hurry if there was a wind. There was one place from which a viewer could see the sunset skies in all their splendor. That place was, of course, the attic window. When the square were outside the seminary began to take on that enchanted glow, Sarah would, if possible, steal away and creep up the flights of stairs to her attics to lean as far out of the window as she could. When she had accomplished this, she always drew a long breath. In the golden light of sunset, even the London air seemed purer. When she had accomplished this, she always drew a long breath. In the golden light of sunset, even the London air seemed purer. Sorry about that. I had to pause for a thing going on. I think I just repeated myself. So to you guys, it's going to sound funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's the problem with me pausing because like a phone rings or something. <laughs> this wonder is mine alone. It is the one joy of life in this attic. The one beauty has, that has been granted to me. No one else ever looked out of the other attics. Generally, the skylights were closed, but even if they were propped open to admit air, no one seemed to come near them. Sarah turned her face upward to the sky, which seemed so friendly and so near, like a lovely vaulted ceiling, and watched the colors change and flow. I love her so much. I hope we have a happy ending too. And soon. <laughs> Sometimes the clouds made islands or great mountains enclosing lakes of deep turquoise blue or liquid amber or cr 
cryophrase green. I don't think I've ever seen that word before. Sometimes dark headlands jutted into strange lost seas. The sparrows twittered softly around her, and Sarah felt for a moment almost as if she could float away into the sky. But in the end, at last, it was necessary to lower her head again. Wait, what was that? For a moment, she thought she had seen a shape beyond the attic window in the house that the gentleman from India had taken. Perhaps someone was there. Perhaps a window will open and a head. But there was no one. Just a trick of the light. Really splendid sunsets always make me feel as if something strange was just going to happen. Perhaps someday it will. Oh no! Ah! Oh, no! No! We're reloading! Eight hunger, five fatigue, that's what we need. No wait, we were on 32. Eight hunger and fatigue. There, there's our hunger. I let it be known, I am not above save scummy. I don't know what happens if you don't get them all in time. I, I assume you get a bad ending, and I don't want a bad ending. Sarah! Jessie caught Sarah's hands in hers, paying no attention to the dirt, and tugged her about. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah! What is it? Jessie did not look entirely well. Her cheeks were flushed, and her eyes glittered brightly as if she were caught in the grip of some wild fever. Perhaps you should lie down. Oh, yes. Do let's go to my room together, dear Sarah. Oh, my. Jessie would not be dissuaded, but led the way, tugging at Sarah's hand and giggling as if they were confidants and equals. Oh, Sarah. It's terribly unfair what they've done to you. Look at you, your skin and bones and bruises. Miss Minchin has no right to starve and abuse you, even if you are penniless, when you're so clever and valuable and you do so much hard work around the school. It is cruel and ridiculous, and you should not stand for it. You are worth so much more. She clasped Sarah's hand in hers. Let's run away together. What? Sarah pulled her hands away. This place is wrong for both of us. We don't belong here. We could be maids together. We could find a great house to take service in and share a bedroom. Oh my. You already have experience and I learn quickly. We can make a new life. You are delirious. Miss Minchin says that I am in her debt. If I ran away, she could have me punished. And what about your parents? They would look for you and they would be very angry. There is no guarantee that we would find positions in service somewhere else or that we would be any better off. We would have no references. We would be just like Becky if we found work at all. At least we would be free and I would take care of you. Sarah, you're fading away here. Sarah wrapped her arms around herself, acknowledging that she was becoming too bony, too frail. Still, it was too hard to admit out loud that Miss Minchin was cruel, that her life sometimes felt unbearable. I am not starving. I have a place to sleep, and clothes to wear, and books to read. I have seen people in the streets of London who have none of those things. If you could see yourself. You only see things that are pretty. You can't imagine what happens on the streets in other parts of London. I have seen children with no fingers on their hands, alone in the cold and worse. I know exactly what would happen to me on the streets of London. The same thing that would happen if I became a ballerina or married Mr. Watney. But if we were together, I could bear it. Oh! Right in my heart. <laughs> 
don't you love me even a little bit, Sarah? Won't you help me? It isn't possible. It's, it's too dangerous. The police would track us. Your hair would give you away. Then I would cut my hair and sell it. She would give it up as quickly as that. No one would find us. It would be like one of your stories, the princess fleeing persecution in disguise. It would be a nice story, but some stories are not so nice when they are real. Could they do it? Sarah's stomach shivered at the prospect. It, it might not be impossible. If Jesse owned a few things they could sell, they might be able to buy food for a while. If they crept away like thieves, though, they would be treated like thieves. It could go very badly, and the weather would continue to grow colder. You're not well. You should lie down and rest. I'll bring you tea. Jessie sat down on her bed. Don't you believe in me? Don't you believe in stories? In magic? I thought you were the one who would always believe. Many things have happened. Please, please don't give up. I need you to be a princess, to believe that there's still something beautiful in the world. Can you give me that? Not all princesses are beautiful. Not all beauty is on the outside. Sarah, I... I'll fetch the tea. You're not well. You must rest. I don't want you to be ill, like my papa. Jessie clapped her hands. So you do love me. Such silly pleasure in the midst of serious worries scraped at Sarah's temper. Just because I don't want you to die doesn't mean I will run away with you. Aren't you going to live with Lavinia? I know you've talked to her about it. As long as you do everything she says, she'll keep you, won't she? Jessie's face crumpled. She stared down at her hands on her lap, not speaking. I might as well have slapped her. I'll fetch the tea. Sarah stepped out of the room and leaned back against the bedroom door. I'm sorry, Jessie. I do care about you and I want you to be happy. Any future would be better for you than the one I have. Sarah stood, looking out at the sunset. There were floods of molten gold covering the west as if a glorious tide were sweeping over the world. A deep, rich yellow light filled the air. The birds flying across the top of the houses showed quite black against it. Sarah sighed to herself as she craned her head upwards. All of a sudden she heard a strange sound. Not a sparrow's chirp, but a strange little squeaky chattering, and it came from the window of the next attic. Sarah turned, excited. Had someone come at last to watch the sunset as she did? There was a head visible, framed there in the skylight, but it was not the head of a little girl or a tired housemaid. In fact, it was the tufted head of a small, black-faced monkey. Oh! For Sarah, it was like catching a glimpse of a long-lost friend passing nearby in a crowd. When she had lived with her papa in India, she had played with just such creatures. She had not thought to see them again. She swung the skylight up, leaning out as far as she dared to get a better look. You darling thing, how I wish you could come for a visit. As if in answer, the monkey wrapped its paw three times against the window's surface. Then all at once it hopped down into its own room, away from the skylight and out of Sarah's view. Sarah waited, hoping he might return if only for a moment. I think I hear him, still chattering away. Perhaps he is swinging from shelf to shelf within their attic as if it were a jungle. No, I do hear something. A voice was speaking in a low tone, not a monkey but a man. And then to her surprise, someone appeared in that attic window. Someone with dark skin and brightly embroidered clothing. A Lascar! He held the monkey in his arms, where it snuggled and chirped against his breast. As Sarah looked toward him, he looked towards her. Hello! Sarah had learned for herself 
how comforting a smile, even from a stranger, might be. Hers was evidently a pleasure to him. He smiled in return, and his whole face was illuminated. Hello, Miss Saeed. He must have come up here for the sun, since it's so seldom seen in England. So you are what Sharon wished for me to see. The monkey brought you here? What a delightful thought that an Indian monkey should bring an Indian man to be my friend. This little one brings me many places. He is forever running into trouble and expecting his tall friends to protect him. The familiar cadences of his accent washed over Sarah like a summer rain. How long it had been since she had heard such a voice. Forgive me, Miss Saeed. I would open the window to greet you properly, but I fear Sharon might try to make an escape. I would not wish to lose him. My friend, my master is ill, and this creature's mischief provides him much amusement. Two, Sharon does not know England or its weathers. He might come to harm. Of course. Perhaps we will meet again on another sunset. The sound of his quiet laughter did not pass through the closed window, but the flashing white of his teeth showed amusement. Until another sunset, Miss Sahib. He disappeared then. She thought it possible that he might have bowed to her, but it was too difficult to tell through a skylight. I wonder if he lives in an attic like me. I was only chasing the monkey. I do not know his rank in that household. I hope England is kinder to him than it was to me. What week are we on? This is week 33? Okay, we're going. Okay, we're almost an hour. I thought maybe it would take 30 minutes to finish Jesse's, but we're almost at an hour. Let's get us some hunger. So did you hear about the fellow next door? Seems he's not an Oriental or an Indian at all. That's what Miss... what Sarah said. Lucky or Becky. Cook was not in enough temper to clout her for calling Sarah Miss in her hearing. Suppose she'd know all about the English gentleman living in that place. I tell you, you'd never get me there, not if I had to jump off a boat and swim home. No, nothing good ever come from India. It's all tigers and cobras and midges that suck the blood right out of you or spit back poison. It's a wonder the children live long enough to be shipped back here. If only Papa had let me stay there. Anyhow, seems that fellow gone and run himself into a hole. Thought he'd lost his own fortune and did. And it drove him to a wreck, thinking he was ruined forever. He weren't, of course. Still rich as anything, but it would do him no good if he died of fret. Trouble was all about mines, and mines with diamonds in them. No savings of mine ever goes into no mines, particularly diamond ones. We all know something of them. <clears throat> Becky gulped and nodded. He felt as my papa did. He was ill, just like my papa, but he did not die. Not yet. Poor man, I hope he will be well. Perhaps he has a child in England as well. For the sake of that child, I would help him any way I could. Or for his own sake, in the sake of my papa, whom I could not save. When Lavinia Herbert set foot in Miss Minchin's kitchen, all work came to a standstill. Becky dropped a spoon in the sink and winced at the loud clatter. Sarah stepped forward to block her from view and to keep Lavinia in sight. Even Cook, who had never known her as Sarah did, reacted to her presence by standing away from her table and bobbing repeatedly. Yes, miss. Was there something you wanted, miss? Ugh! She covered her mouth and nose with a dainty motion of her hand. Begging your pardon, miss. I need to talk to that girl. Which girl, miss? Her! That one! She fluttered a hand in Sarah's direction, but would not be so vulgar as to point. There are two of us standing here. You will need to say our names if you please. Sarah! Where is Jessie? What? Where is she? You must know. I have not seen her today. Perhaps she went for a walk? She never goes anywhere without telling me. Except when she's with you. Do you think I don't know what you do? What? She's my best friend. She'll never choose you. Is she jealous? Just then, 
there came a commotion from the entrance hall. Heavy boots stomped through the door, followed by a high-pitched sneeze that made Sarah's eyes water just to hear it. Miss Minton's voice carried faintly through the halls. Get her up to her rooms. I will summon a doctor. Jessie! She ran from the kitchens at once. Sarah moved to follow. Oh, no, you don't. Get back to work. But someone is in trouble. You'll see some trouble if you don't have those pans clean before supper. Becky touched Sarah's arm with a damp, soap-worn hand. It's all right, miss. She's one of theirs. They'll look after her. Miss Minchin wouldn't want anything to happen to one of her paying pupils, even if Jessie's family isn't one of the richest. And Lavinia was worried about her. She does care about Jessie, truly, even if she seems callous at times. She will ensure that Jessie is well tended to. Still, it made Sarah's loving heart burn with frustration to be able, unable to look after a friend in need. Sarah's growing sympathy for her neighbor added a new possibility to any errands she might be sent on in the evening. There was a chance that his curtains might not be drawn. She might be able to see inside. When that, when that was the case, if no one was about, she would stop and take hold of the iron railings, looking into those warm rooms and wishing good thoughts to her adopted friend. Perhaps kind thoughts reach people somehow, even through windows and doors and walls. Perhaps you feel a little warm and comforted and don't know why. The man sat alone in an armchair by the fire, nearly always in a great dressing gown and nearly always with his forehead resting in his hand as he gazed hopelessly into the fire. He always seems as if he were thinking of something that worries him. He has got his money back, so he ought not to look like that. I wonder if there is something else. I hope you will get well and happy again. I am so sorry for you. I wish you had a little missus who could pet your head, as I used to pet Papa when he had a headache. I should like to be your little missus myself, poor man. Good night. Good night. God bless you. She would go away feeling quite comforted and a little warmer herself. Her sympathy was so strong that it seemed as if it must reach him somehow. One day, Although Sarah's viewpoint through the window did not allow her to see it, the man in his house was not alone. Carmichael, I cannot believe that the wretched woman has disappeared without a trace. With the loss of her two best-paying pupils in such a short time, Madame Pascal's finances were in great disarray. She apparently found it necessary to close her school entirely. It was something of a scandal in Paris which turned out to our benefit. Without those rumors, we might not have found the child's trail so quickly. But your sources have no idea what might have happened to her after that. As the story goes, after her father's death left her unprovided for, she was then adopted, taken in by the parents of the little girl who had so recently died at that same school. The two girls had been close companions before the accident, you see. After that, a child without a parents and parents without a child, it seemed the best solution all around to this family, who were extremely well-to-do Russians, took the child off her hands. And after that, Madame Pascal found herself in difficulty and absconded. I have not been able to contact her. When I think of all the dreadful things that could happen in this world to a child without protection, if this is the child you are in search of, she would seem to be in the hands of people who can afford to take care of her. But you say if the child is the one I am in search of. You say if. We are not sure. Without Madame Pascal's confirmation of the father's identity, we cannot be certain. Still, the circumstances were curiously similar. An English officer in India had placed his motherless girl at the school. He's died suddenly after losing his fortune. If you are certain that the child was left at a school in Paris, it seems most likely that she is the one. My dear fellow, I am certain of nothing. I never saw either the child or her mother. The mother was a French woman, and I had heard she wished her child to be educated in Paris, but I do not, cannot know. As if drawn by the sound of raised voices, the Lascar whom Sarah had seen in the attic entered, bringing a tea service with him. Rest your health, self, Sahib. You do no good if you are not well. He accepted a cup with a sigh. You are right, as always wrong. Still, I must find the girl. If she is alive, she is somewhere. 
If she is friendless and penniless, it is through my fault. Why was I not man enough to stand my ground when things looked black? My poor Ralph put into the scheme every penny he owned. He trusted me. He loved me. And he died thinking I had ruined him. I, Tom Carrisford, who was at Eton closer to him than a brother. What a villain he must have thought me. Ram Dass rested a comforting hand on his master's frail shoulder. You were ill, Sahib. Your mind was not whole. You are not to blame. Overwhelmed with despair and half delirious with fever because I was weak. And then I ran away and collapsed in the jungle alone. I thought I wanted to die and I know well that I nearly did. He looked up at Carmichael with a self-deprecating smile. It was only thanks to Ram Dass that I was discovered and brought back to the hospital in time. If you had no strength of heart, Sahib, you would not have survived those weeks of fever. Mr. Carrisford reached up and clasped the other man's hand. You are too good to me. Mr. Carmichael harumphed gently, reminding them of his presence in the room. Yes, well, when I returned to consciousness, poor Crewe was dead and buried, and my own mind was in a haze. I did not recall the child's existence for weeks, and I have never been able to remember her name. Surely he must have spoken of her to you. Anything he said about the school could be a clue. With nothing more to go on, it will be difficult for me to tell if we have found the right girl. Unscrupulous people might not hesitate to provide a false heiress. He used to call her by an odd pet name he had invented. He called her his little missus. But the wretched diamond mine drove everything else out of our heads. Well, don't despair. We shall find her yet. According to my Paris sources, the good-hearted Russians who left Madame Pascal's school were named An Anizimov. They most likely lived in Moscow. I will go there and see what can be learned. If I were able to travel, I would go with you. But I can only sit here wrapped in furs and stare at the fire. I am useless. You are improving. If I travel to Moscow and that is not kept Ralph Cruz's child, I will return. By then, I am sure you will be able to move on to Paris with me to continue the search. Have faith. Carrisford shook his head. When I look into the fire, I seem to see Crewe's gay young face gazing back at me, waiting for me to reassure him, and I cannot answer. If only we had never parted or never reunited. Is that truly what you wish, Sahib? That you had stayed together? No, no, of course not. It would have come to the same end in time if we had traveled to France together as once we planned. And yet, better by far that I had never found him again than to know it was I who brought him to ruin. I must not fail him now, whatever the cost. Well. So, that was the guy. I think everyone knows this, but uh, Sarah's father, Captain Crew, um, was convinced by a friend to pour all his money into diamond mines. And then that didn't work out and Sarah's father died. Um, that was the guy who was Sarah's father's friend who convinced him to pour all his money into the diamond mines. So he's actually looking for Sarah. Um, and doesn't realize that she's literally right next door under his nose. Drama. And I knew that because I, that's, this is actually really... That part, I believe, is really true to the source material, which I haven't read in a while. But 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 I, I remember kind of being along those lines. <laughs> so I think we're close to the end. This is going to be another long one. I'm sorry. Sarah sat upon her hard attic bed, looking down at her feet, which were red and throbbing. Emily, as always, smiled absently on the proceedings. She was not sitting up quite straight today, as Sarah had bumped against her chair and not yet taken the time to write her. It has been hard to be a princess today, Emily. It has been harder than usual. It gets harder as the weather grows colder and the streets get more sloppy. When Lavinia laughed at my muddy skirt as I passed her in the hall, I thought of something horrible to say all in a flash, and I only just stopped myself in time. You can't sneer back at people like that if you are a princess. You have to bite your tongue to hold yourself in. I bit mine. She drew her knees up to her chest, 
wrapping her arms around her legs. It was a cold afternoon, Emily, and it will be a colder night. Quite suddenly, she put her dark head down against her arms. Oh, Papa, what a long time it seems since I was your little missus. There was no answer. After a few moments, she lifted her head again, smiling as bravely as a soldier. The sun is setting, Emily. We mustn't waste it. I never guessed how short the days in England could be in winter. I must bid a good night to the sun, so it does not decide to leave us completely. The sun might be more comfortable in India, but we need it here. With that bit of self-encouragement, she managed to climb to her feet and raise the skylight to let in the sun. No sooner had she swung up the window than a bundle of fur blurred through the opening, alighting solidly on Sarah's shoulder with all its paws before springing off again. It was the monkey, Saron. Oh dear, he got loose. He landed on her bed, scampered towards her pillow, and then swung himself around and into the darkness beneath the bed frame, with only the long curve of his tail still in sight. Sarah looked quickly at the door to her room to be sure it was closed. Miss Minchin would be furious at such a creature running loose through her school. But what was she to do to him? Helpless, she stuck her head back out of the skylight and found the concerned face of the Lascar there opposite. Miss Sahib, have you seen? Oh, sir, Sharon has come through my window. Should I try to catch him for you? He is hiding under my bed. There was an angry chittering. She looked down to see that the monkey was now running across the floor towards the rusty grate. Ah, Miss Sahib, it would not be wise. He is a good monkey and will not bite unless one pulls at his tail. But he is very difficult to catch. He flies like the lightning when he wishes. He does not know you, and I do not think he will allow you to catch him. Even myself, he obeys only when he chooses. But he is not wicked, only playful. I believe that I might be able to coax him if, if it is allowed that I enter. He is very polite. He must be concerned that I will think it a great liberty for a strange man to enter my rooms, as if they were truly mine. Like a grand hostess, she spread an encompassing arm. If you can cross the rooftop safely, then enter and be welcome on your quest. Sharon is running from side to side of the room now. I don't think he is happy here. The rooftops of London were treacherous terrain of loose, damp tiles, slanting surfaces, and terrifying drops. Only the direst of threats could ever coax Sarah out of her window. The Lascar, however, slipped across and through as easily as if he had been walking on roofs all his life. He landed on Sarah's bed with scarcely a sound, and then to the floor where he bowed a salam to her. It was the first time she had seen him so clearly. The look of him, the color and fabric of his attire, still evoked that painful half-familiarity of her lost memories. But the man himself was unusual. His bow had been as deep and polite as any Indian servant, but he moved as lightly as a magician and stood with the strong shoulders of a soldier. Sorry, strong sh shoulders of a soldier. Apparently I, I make those words sound the same. <laughs> his eyes and smile were warm, if enigmatic, and the knife on his belt he wore with confidence. Oh, he is like a character in a fairy tale. The brave wanderer who will surpass all the witch's challenges. And for that reason he remained fixed in Sarah's mind as the left guard. And it did not occur to her to ask his name or provide her own. Thank you for your hospitality, Miss Sahib. His eyes swept the room, and Sarah felt a sudden surge of shame. Everything here is dirty and ragged, including me. I am no longer fit to be called Sahib. But if he had such thoughts, he did not voice them. Now for this little one. It was not a very long chase. The monkey prolonged it a few minutes, evidently for the mere fun of it. But presently he sprang chattering onto the man's shoulder. You see? He is hard to catch when he is running, but when he wishes, he will come to a friend. He is like a child to me and my master. Many thanks, Miss Sahib, for your aid. Perhaps if you meet again, Sharon will know you as a friend. I hope so. He did not presume to stay long within her rooms, but salaamed again and made a swift exit. It gave Sarah a wistful sort of pain to recall that she, the drudge whom the cook had insulted less than an hour ago, had once been surrounded by people who salaamed just so whenever she went by. What a kind man. He could not help but see how shabby this room of mine is. But he still spoke to me 
as if I were someone important and valuable. She walked around her room, setting Emily back in place upon her chair and riding any other objects disarrayed by the monkey's passage. If only we, all of us, could go back to India together. Sarah opened Jessie's bedroom door with some trepidation. The red-headed girl had not attended class that day, and after the painful coughing fit she had overheard, Sarah was loath to disturb her. But for all the same reasons, Sarah needed to. Needed to see that Jessie's illness was not so severe, that she would recover rather than fade away like those stricken on the streets of London. Sarah. She was awake, lying back against the cushions, her hair spread around her like a cloak. Her voice was weak but lucid. I came to get your laundry. I'll be gone in a moment. Stay a while? Please, it's dreadfully dull lying here. All right. Sarah took a seat on a padded stool near the bed. Why did you go out alone that day? Lavinia was worried. Only Lavinia? I was busy. I didn't know you had gone anywhere. I have to work. I know. I'm sorry. I wanted to be alone for as long as I still could. I went for a walk along the river. But you were already unwell, and it's cold outside. Jessie looked away, her mouth twisting as if Sarah had said something funny. Perhaps it was only that she had stated the obvious. The cold was inescapable these days. Even in the seminary rooms with well-tended hearths, a chill lingered at the edges, coating the walls more solidly than any whitewash. You go out, though. Because I don't have any choice. I'm sent out. In India, we had to move during the summer, because it was too hot and it would make us ill. I think schools in London ought to move during the winter. There's nowhere to go. The rest of England is even colder. Jessie smiled faintly. If I had my way, you and I could travel for the winter, to France or Spain, or even further, if things had worked out like I hoped. She paused to cough into her hand. Oh, Sarah, I admire you so much. You were like a fairy when you first came to this school, a creature from a fantasy land who didn't quite walk on the same ground that we did, and you told such pretty stories. And the look on Miss Minton's face when you spoke French to Monsieur Defarge. Even Lavinia laughed. Lavinia would laugh at anyone being discomfited, including you. You are thinking something not so flattering about Lavinia, aren't you? I... Perhaps. But it was an unworthy thought. You see, you're not like me. You're so noble and clever, even in rags. I really can't believe you're still a princess sometimes. I wish you were. I wish it had all been true. We had such a beautiful dream, didn't we? Traveling the world together to appreciate art and beauty. I know I'm just a silly girl, but when I'm with you, everything in the world seems more interesting. You see things that I don't. You are magical. You... You shouldn't talk so much. You're not well. You'll strain your throat. No matter how sick I am, this is more important. Jessie pulled herself up to a sitting position, then pressed her hands to her head, dizzy. It will be your own fault. If your head falls off and rolls away, Jessie giggled. I suppose you know a story about a man whose head rolled away. I wish you could stay by my side forever and tell me stories. She paused for a moment, coughing faintly. Lavinia doesn't accept my feelings. She says I ought to be grateful to my parents for making a good match for me with Mr. Watney. I'm not sure if she means it. She often says things she doesn't mean. Sometimes she says she will take me with her, when she finishes her school, but only if I am good. And I am not sure if she means that either. It won't matter either way if she doesn't act before my parents do. But that, that's not what I wanted to say to you. 
She took a deep breath, then cleared her throat. Even if... Even if Lavinia were willing to offer me an escape. It is you, Sarah, that I truly wish to stand beside. Do you understand? There is no prince in the ballroom. It is a princess I was hoping to meet. And I did. You have such fascinating eyes. When I look into them, I want to believe that miracles can happen. Oh, Sarah, I do love you so. And then, for the first time, Jessie leaned over and kissed her. I'm just, I'm going to sit here and cry. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. Jessie's hair fell around them like a blanket of red. It was the warmest, most beautiful color that Sarah had ever seen. I wish I could be the princess you were waiting for. She reached out to brush Jessie's hair away. It tickled over the back of her hand like a feather. I, I must go before Cook misses me. I just wanted to see that you were all right. Just a moment. There's something I want you to have. She pulled on her dress and swung her legs over to get out of bed. Are you sure you should be up? I can fetch it for you. I am not as sick as all that. It's only a chill that can't carry me away. She walked over to her dressing table and searched her jewelry box, withdrawing at last a small gold heart on a delicate chain. I want you to have this. It's been mine since I was very young. It is a token of my esteem for you, so that you can remember me if I must go away. You aren't thinking of running away again, are you? No. After all, where would I go? She tucked the locket into Sarah's hand and closed her fingers over it. Keep it safe for me. All right. I really ought to take your laundry and go. I'll be scolded for delaying. Of course, I don't want to get you into any trouble. Carefully sweeping her hair out from under her, she returned to her position in the bed. I will lie here and dream of floating among the lilies. Again, a faint fluttering in Sarah's heart. Something was wrong. Jessie, why did you go to the river alone in the cold to think? What were you thinking about? Jessie looked into Sarah's eyes her smile edged with inward pointing knives. A romantic heroine, thwarted in love, denied all hope. It would be fitting for her story to end with her pulled down to the mud at the bottom of the brook, wouldn't it? That's Shakespeare, Ophelia. The ballet is no better. When her heart is broken, Giselle stabs herself with her lover's sword. A beautiful and tragic end. There is nothing beautiful about death. The beauty is in the tragedy. Ophelia, Giselle, Romeo, if they hadn't given in to despair, they might have been able to save their loves. I went to the river. I looked at the bridge. But I am not going to climb over it. Not so long as I can still believe in miracles. And if I might lose my belief, then that's why I gave you my heart to hold, so you can believe for me. Jesse, go. Finish your chores. I need my beauty sleep. You will get better. Jesse reclined against the pillows and closed her eyes. She will be all right, won't she? The days continued to grow colder and the nights longer. There were days on which Sarah trampled through snow 
when she went on her errands. There were worse days when the snow melted and combined itself with mud to form slush. On such days, the study in which the Indian gentleman sat glowed with warmth and rich color, but the little attic at Miss Minchin's was dismal beyond words. Becky sometimes crept into Sarah's room, and the two of them would huddle together under a shared blanket for warmth. They were torn for you, miss, and your stories of the Bastille and being prisoners together. I think I should die here. Seems too real now, don't it? The missus is more like a head jailer every day she lives. I can just see them big keys you say she carries. And cooks like one of the under jailers, having relations with the army man that helped throw over them nobles. Tell me some more, please, miss. Tell me about the subterranean passage we've dug under the walls. I'll tell you something warmer. I'll tell you about the tropical forest where Sharon, the monkey from next door, used to live. I have seen him sometimes, looking out the window with that mournful expression. I always feel sure he is thinking about the tropical jungle where he used to swing by his tail from coconut trees. I wonder if he was captured to make a pet, or if he chose to leave the trees to make friends with tall people. That is what Lascar called himself, one of Sharan's tall friends. I wonder if he left a family behind who had depended on him to bring home coconuts. Ain't coconuts the big, round, hard ones, miss? Can a monkey eat that? They beat them against rocks to crack them, then pull them apart with their paws. It must be hard work for such a small creature. Perhaps Siran grew tired of fetching food and leapt from the trees to land on the shoulder of a pasking mascar and became his friend so that someone else would feed him. Imagine being a monkey with your own fur coat and friends to bring your meals. That is warmer, miss. But some days even the Bastille is sort of heatin' when you gets to tellin' about it. That is because it makes you think of something else. She wrapped the coverlet around herself until only a hint of her face could be seen in shadow. What you have to do with your mind when your body is miserable is to make it think of something else. Can you do it, miss? Sometimes I can, and sometimes I can't. But when I can, I'm all right. I believe we always could if we practiced enough. When things are horrible, just horrible, I think as hard as ever I can of being a princess. I say to myself, I am a princess, a fairy princess, and because I am a fairy, nothing in this world can truly hurt me. I could believe you was a fairy, easier than I could believe me, miss. You have to practice harder, that's all. We're nothing different, you and I. Now close your eyes and think about flowers, bright and red and beautiful, nodding in the sunlight. Okay. I have no idea. There's some sorrow. There's some more sorrow. There's a lot of sorrow. Look at all our sorrow. On nights when Becky was kept busy too long to join Sarah in her room, the attic seemed even more desolate. When the fog hung heavy, there was no light at all to be had, and Sarah was forced to beg a candle from Cook in order to see it all. Even that comfort could be snatched from her when cold draughts raced and rattled through the empty spaces. Sarah sat, lay in the starless black, unable to sleep, unable to move. There seemed no hope to be found. I think Becky was right, Emily. Even Emily could not be seen in the gloom. Sarah closed her eyes. I shall die here. I can't bear this. I'm cold, I'm wet, I'm starving to death. I've walked a thousand miles today and they've done nothing but scold me from morning until night. Cook keeps punishing me for not being fast enough. I've had no supper again. I've tried to pretend that I have, but... You aren't listening to me, are you, Emily? I told Becky we were just the same. But all that means is that neither one of us is a princess. Maybe there aren't any princesses, 
not anywhere, and we just dreamed that there were. Oh. This is all there is, work and pain and being hungry forever and always. Sarah lay there with her eyes closed and her body trembling. She could not remember the moment when at last she fell asleep. Wait. What? Okay. So there's a built-in week allowance if we hadn't made the requirements last time, I guess. Not long ago, Sarah Crew had been a beautiful child, but lack of food does no good to anyone, unless to a girl still in the course of growing. She was constantly cold and hungry and tired, and the stress and the pain of it gave her face a pinched expression. Now and then some kind-hearted person passing her in the street glanced at her with sudden sympathy, but she did not notice. She hurried on, trying to make her mind think of something else. She fought to suppose and pretend even as muddy water squelched through her broken shoes. Suppose I had dry clothes on. Suppose I had good shoes and a long, thick coat with wool stockings and a whole umbrella. And suppose, just suppose, when I was near a baker's where they sold hot buns, I should find sixpence which belonged to nobody. And suppose I should go into the shop and buy six of the hottest buns and eat them all up without stopping. Some very odd things happen in the world sometimes. She had to cross the street just when she was saying this to herself. The mud was dreadful and she almost had to wade. She picked her way as carefully as she could, looking down at her feet to choose her steps. Just as she reached the pavement, she saw something shining in the gutter. It was actually a piece of silver, a tiny piece trodden upon by many feet. Not quite a sixpence, but the next thing to it, a four-penny piece. In one second, it was in her cold little hand. Oh, it's true! It is true! It's like magic! She looked up at the shops facing her. There, not a few steps away, was a baker's shop, and a cheerful woman with rosy cheeks was putting into the window a tray of delicious newly baked buns. It almost made Sarah feel faint for a few seconds. The shock and the sight of the buns and the delightful odors of warm bread floating up through the baker's cellar window. She knew she need not hesitate to use the little piece of money. It had been lying in the mud for some time, quite forgotten by its owner in the stream of people passing by. And yet, it did not seem quite right. It was like magic, and magic in all her fairy stories always came with a test. It was then that Sarah caught sight of the child. There were beggar children all over London. When Sarah had been wealthy, she saw them often and gave them pennies when she could. In her more recent suffering, she rarely had time to notice these others. There was a little figure who was not much more than a bundle of rags, from which small, bare, red, muddy feet peeped out, because the rags with which the owner was trying to cover them were not long enough. Above the rags appeared a shock of tangled hair, and a dirty face with big, hollow, hungry eyes. Sarah knew they were hungry eyes the moment she saw them, and she felt a sudden sympathy. The eyes were watching her. They expected nothing more than to be passed by as always, and yet Sarah felt compelled to approach the owner of the eyes and speak. Are, are you hungry? Ain't I just? Her voice was hoarse and raspy with the cold, but Sarah could understand her perfectly. When was the last time you ate? Dunno. Never got nothing today, nowhere. I asked and asked. No dinner, no breakfast, no supper. No, nothing. Just to look at her made Sarah more hungry and faint. If I'm a princess, then... When they were poor and driven from their thrones, they always shared with the populace. If they met one poorer and hungrier than themselves, they always shared. This is one of the populace. Clutching her silver coin, Sarah went into the warmth of the baker's shop and ordered four currant buns, the sort that were one for a penny. The baker was a good-natured woman, and seeing such a cold and hungry child in front of her, slipped six buns into the paper bag, insisting that the extra two were only for make-weight. 
Sarah made her thanks and hurried from the shop so as not to get in the way of more important customers. The hot buns, even in their bag, warmed her hands. The beggar girl was still huddled up on the corner of the shop. She looked frightful in her wet and dirty rags and stared straight in front of her with a glazed look of suffering. Sarah took out one of the buns and with a pang set it on the child's lap. See, this is nice and hot. Eat it and you will not feel so hungry. The child stared up at her as if such sudden amazing good luck almost frightened her. Then she snatched up the bun and began to cram it into her mouth with great wolfish bites. Sarah took out two more buns and set them down. Three and three, that was an even share. The sound of the child's hoarse, ravenous voice, nearly choking in delight as she gobbled her food, was awful. She is hungrier than I am. I have a place to sleep at night, and Miss Minchin feeds me sometimes. But her hand trembled as she sat down the fourth bun. That left Sarah with two, one bun for each hand to keep them warm. She's starving. I am not starving. She put down the fifth bun and turned away. The little London savage was too busy devouring to give any thanks, even if she had ever been taught politeness, which she had not. Sarah found some comfort in her remaining bun. At all events, it was very hot, and it was better than nothing. As she walked along, she broke off small pieces and ate them slowly to make them last longer. Suppose it was a magic bun, and a few bites were as much as a whole dinner. I should be overeating if I took more than one. That is the way magic works. It gives you just enough. I don't need anything more. sobbing over here that's that's fine when the weather was bad Sarah and the other servants were especially busy making sure that mud and ice did not invade the entrance hall while she scraped and toiled many events took place around London of which she had no knowledge a kindly baker moved by seeing a cold and hungry child give away most of her buns to one even less fortunate than herself, offered to take the beggar child in. A large family of children, once glimpsed in their Sunday carriage, laughed over their father's letters and promises to bring them pictures of Muzik's and Drosky's when he returned from Moscow. And as Miss Minchin's attic, someone stealthily opened the skylight from the outside. Ah! He let himself down through the aperture with such lightness and dexterity that he made only the slightest sound, but that was enough to frighten a curious rat back into its hiding hole. Forgive me, I do not come to do harm to your mistress. Few would waste politeness on a rat or consider it to be a pet, but this man knew that Sarah was not as other children. He had watched her in secret, seen how she made friends of all the little things around her, the rats, the sparrows, even the sky she greeted as if it could hear her. By the mistress of the house, she is treated like a pariah, but she has the bearing of a child who should be the blood of kings. First he went to the narrow bed. He pressed his hand upon the mattress, then lifted the covering and examined one thin pillow. To the rusty fireplace then, examining the grate which had not seen a fire in many days. The old table, the tattered footstool, Emily's chair, each was carefully tested and set back as it had been. At last, he took to the walls. From his pocket, he carefully withdrew a number of small sharp nails. Without the aid of a hammer, he pressed them one at a time into the crumbling plaster. He looked around, nodded, then pulled himself up to the skylight and withdrew as swiftly and silently as he had entered, leaving no sign. What's he doing? I don't know what he's doing. He's worried about us, I guess. Okay, I assume this is the last one. If it's not, I'm gonna have to pause. I've been talking for almost three hours now and I'm going to lose my voice. <laughs> Sarah walked carefully up the stairs, keeping the tea tray balanced. Two cups, a little pot, a three-tiered tower of finger sandwiches and a scattering of little biscuits. It was not the heaviest tray she had ever carried, but it was work enough for her thin, weary arms. 
Sarah's own stomach rumbled rebelliously at the sight of the spread right in front of her, but she dared not filch a single bite. After all, this tray was for Lavinia. As she approached the bedroom, Sarah saw to her dismay that the door was closed. I should have had Becky come up with me to knock. She did not dare attempt to balance the tray one-handed, and calling through the door would be vulgar. Careful not to disarrange the contents, she set the tray upon a hall table. Once the weight was off her arms, her slender wrists began to ache, but she could not take time to rest. She knocked upon the door. Yes, what is it? I've brought your tea. At last, please bring it in at once. Sarah opened the door, then turned back to pick up the tea tray again. Just as she was about to enter Lavinia's room, the door slammed shut in her face. Titters of laughter escaped around its edges. There was nothing to do but set the tray down and open the door again. Inside, Lavinia was seated like a queen upon her bed, her back supported by a nest of pillows. Beside her lay Jessie, her head in Lavinia's lap, her hair spreading like a spiderweb over Lavinia's skirts. Her eyes, meeting Sarah's, were haunted. Neither of them was anywhere near the door. Well, where is our tea? The door shut before I could bring it inside. Oh dear, it must have been the wind. Jessie sucked in a breath, but before she could speak, Lavinia's hand pressed down hard upon her head, silencing her. You had better hurry and bring it in before the tea gets cold, or you will have to start all over again. Yes, miss. She returned to the hallway and picked up the tray, trying to steady her shaking hands. This time she was just stepping through the entrance when the wooden door rushed at her. Tired as she was, she had no chance to dodge. The door struck the tray in her hands with jarring force, sending sandwiches onto the floor and a splash of hot tea onto Sarah's arm. The pain was rapid and intense. Sarah cried out, dropping the tray. She barely managed to stumble backwards before the fallen teapot could douse her feet as well. The door opened, revealing a wide-eyed girl, Jessie who had slammed the door in Sarah's face, Jessie who had burned her arm, Jessie who had too clearly done all this at the orders of a smirking Lavinia. What a terrible mess! Jessie, tell the scullery girl she'll have to clean all that up and bring us a new tray. Jessie stooped grabbing for bread and biscuits and setting them back on the tray. She spoke under her breath. I'm so sorry. I wouldn't have. I didn't mean to hurt you. Go take care of yourself. Don't come back here. I can't stop her. Please, don't come back. She raised her voice then, affecting annoyance. You heard her. Hurry up and go. And Sarah fled. <laughs> Why? There was little sympathy in the kitchens for a girl so clumsy and foolish as to burn herself with tea. But at least there was cold water to pour over the mark. Cook most graciously allowed Becky to carry the new serving tray while Sarah tended her injury. But in exchange and punishment, she would receive no supper that night. It was with a heavy heart, an empty stomach, and a still sore arm that she mounted the stairs to her attic bedroom that night. Oh, Jessie, how could you do such a thing? She does not mean to be cruel. She only tries to please Lavinia because she is desperate to escape the threat of marriage. She gave me her heart. As she reached the top, she was surprised to see a glimmer of light coming from under the attic door. Nobody goes there but myself and Becky, but someone has lighted a candle. Has Jessie crept up for an evening visit? It was not Jessie. Miss Minchin? Candlelight flashed and flickered around the desolate attic. When Sarah had left it in the morning, her bed had been tidy if threadbare. Now her pitiful furnishings were overturned and scattered. Even Emily lay upon her face on the floor, her petticoats over her head. Sarah, what is the meaning of this? From her hand dangled a golden locket. That is not for you. Stealing! I am absolutely shocked at this behavior. 
Here I have given you a roof over your head and meaningful employment, and this is how you repay me? I did not steal it. It was a gift. Do not lie to me, Sarah. No one makes gifts to a worthless little drudge. Admit it. You stole this. What were you planning to trade it for? I didn't lie to you before, and I won't lie now. I didn't steal anything. Jesse gave me the locket. Miss Minchin's hands cracked across Sarah's face impudent as well as a thief how dare you speak the name of a young lady as if she were your equal jesse is my equal we are both in service to a cruel mistress and you are no equal of hers when miss herbert first informed me that she was missing a piece of her jewelry i did not believe that you would be the culprit i see that i have been too lenient with you herbert is lavinia lavinia she told Miss Minchin that it was her locket? I ought to have you in front of the magistrates for this. You are very lucky that my duties do not currently afford me the time to take you properly into hand. You would have no food tomorrow, no breakfast, no dinner, and no supper. Perhaps that will teach you a bit of humility. She left the room, carrying the necklace and the candlestick with her. Sarah stood swaying in the center of the dark room. Her stomach was tight and empty. Her cheek felt hot where it had been slapped. Worse was the pain in her arm, which still stung where it had been burned. I didn't steal. I wouldn't. No matter what, I wouldn't. The light was too dim to see properly. Slowly she sank to her knees. Her questing hand found Emily upon the floor, picked her up, and straightened out her dress. Lavinia sent me here. She called me a thief. If only I were a thief, I might not be so hungry. Unexpectedly, there came a knock at the door. Miss? Miss, are you in there? Becky, come in. Becky crept inside. Only bits of her face and apron remained light enough to be seen in the dimness. Miss, as you know, my room's all turned over. Miss Minchin was up in the attics, looking for something she thought was stolen. She went through my things as well. You wouldn't steal. She thinks I did. Oh, miss, thank you for helping me today, Becky. Please go back to bed. Yes, miss. Alone in the dark, Sarah picked up her scattered belongings and returned them to their places. Miss Minchin didn't care about the truth. She could have asked Jessie if she wanted to. She had her mind made up before I came into the room. But what is the truth? How did Lavinia know about the necklace? Was it hers, and Jessie took it? Or did Jessie tell her that she gave it to me? Jessie will do anything at all to win Lavinia's favor, and Lavinia will never cease to be cruel. Jessie gave me her heart because she wanted to believe in miracles. But here I am, and all the miracles have gone wrong. Oh, Papa, why did you have to die? Sarah lay upon her bed, the only warmth beneath her sheets was the burning of her wounds, and the only substance that filled her belly was regret. Sarah did not know how long she slept that night, but she had been tired enough to sleep deeply and profoundly, too deeply and soundly to be disturbed by anything. When she woke at last, it was slowly and sleepily, as one who is not quite sure where the boundaries lie between waking and dreaming. She felt warm, comfortable, Perhaps even too warm, and that, of course, she could not believe. The attic was never warm and cozy, except in her most beautiful supposings. What a nice dream. I don't want to wake up. But even though she kept her eyes closed tightly, she could not stay asleep. Something in the room was forcing her to awaken. It was a sense of light and sound, the sound of a crackling, roaring little fire. What could it be? Oh, I haven't awakened. I am dreaming yet. She sat up, resting on her elbow, and her breathing came fast. It isn't melting away. I have never had such a dream before. She scarcely dared to stir, but at last she pushed the bedclothes aside and put her feet on the floor. I can smell it. I can smell the fire and food. It, it feels real, but it can't be. It's bewitched, or I'm bewitched, and I only think I see it all. Oh, but if I can only keep on thinking it, I don't care. She sprang up, 
touch the table, the dishes, the rug. She went to the bed and touched the blankets. She took up the soft, wadded dressing gown and suddenly clutched it to her breast and held it to her cheek. It's warm, it's soft, it's real, it must be. She almost staggered to the books and opened the one which lay upon the top. Something was written on the fly leaf to the little girl in the attic from a friend. When she saw that, she put her face down upon the book just for a moment and burst into tears. Someone cared. In a moment, she collected her wits and ran to the attic door to signal her companion. Becky, Becky, wake up, come and see. Miss? Becky stared around the room, her eyes moving from one item to another, growing larger with every moment. The soft slippers, the fire, the books. Around and around her gaze went until she looked quite dizzy with it all. Miss, how can it be? I don't know. Maybe it was magic after all. The magic that won't ever quite let the worst things happen. She removed the covers from the dishes on the table. Look, Becky, muffins, still warm. If it's magic, Miss, then do you think it could melt away? Hadn't we better enjoy it quick? I was thinking the same thing. And she picked up a muffin and crammed as much as she could into her mouth all at once. Stop, you'll make yourself sick. Maybe we do only have this for a moment, but if that's so, we should enjoy it the best that we can. And that means eating slowly enough that we taste it. They sat before the blazing fire and ate the warm, nourishing food, and they could not help looking at each other in a kind of joyous wonder. The sleepy comfort which at length almost overpowered them was a heavenly thing. It was the drowsiness of happy, well-fed childhood, and they sat in the fire's glow and luxuriated in it. Reckon we better get down to work, miss, unless the magic's gone and made Miss Midgen disappear too. I suppose you're right. We wouldn't want her to come up here looking for us now. I don't know if all this will be here when we get back. Maybe it was only lent to us for one day because we needed it so badly. If it ain't here in the evening, miss, it's been here in the morning anyways and I shan't never forget it. She looked at each particular thing and pointed to them in turn as if to record them in her memory. The fire was there, and the table was before it, and the lamp was there with its rosy red light. And there was satin on your bed, and there was soup and sandwiches and muffins. There was. Together, still wrapped in the warmth of their secret, Becky and Sarah walked down the narrow attic stairs and back into the lives of drudgery. Yet Sarah could not help but be changed by the experience. She walked into the schoolroom with a springing step, color in her cheeks, and a smile hovering about the corners of her mouth. Her high spirits were quite astonishing to see, especially to one who had expected her to be humbled and weakened. What is the meaning of this? You do not look as if you realize that you are in disgrace. Are you absolutely hardened? I beg your pardon, Miss Minchin. I know that I am in disgrace. Be good enough not to forget it, and look as if you have come into it a fortune. It is an impertinence. And remember that you are to have no food today. Yes, Miss Minchin. If the magic had not saved me just in time, how horrible it would have been. <sighs> Guys, I don't know what to do. Because on the one hand, I, I really... I'm going to put it up down here. Um, I really want to finish this out. But on the other hand, I am, my voice is just gone. <laughs> um, but I don't want to upload these and leave you hanging. Um, gosh, it's a two hour video now. And I don't know whether to cut it here and then try to finish it out or to keep going. I guess I've had long videos in the past, so we'll keep going. We're on week 37. Surely it won't go over 40, right? Right? You guys would tell me if it was going to go over 40. <laughs> it's like the book that won't ever end. <laughs> okay. The gifts in the attic had not disappeared. In fact, they had increased the first night. Becky and Sarah had returned to the attic to find the table set once more, now with cups and plates for both of them, a new supper, and a vase with fresh flowers on the mantelpiece. And 
After that, there seemed to be no pattern to it, but every day or so, some new comfort or wonder would materialize when no one was watching. The walls were covered with pictures and draperies. Books were stacked into place. The remains of old meals cleared away and new food left in its place. It is exactly like something fairy coming true. Is this my garret? Am I in the same cold, ragged, damp Sarah? And to think I used to pretend and pretend and wish there were fairies. I feel as if I might be a fairy myself and able to turn things into anything else. I feel as if I might wish for anything. Diamonds or bags of gold and they would appear. As best she could manage, she split her bounty with Becky. The furnishings were difficult for a little girl to move on her own, and the books were of no interest to her friend, but other things could be shared. A new mattress had appeared, and so Sarah's old thin one was moved and stacked atop Becky's, along with half of the new blankets and pillows, and Becky proclaimed it the most comfortable sleep she'd ever had. But where does it all come from, miss? Who does it? Isn't it more beautiful not to know? It's just that... Becky pointed to the pink and white lilies in the vase, whose petals up erupted outward like a joyous shoot. I remember you telling stories about heavens, miss, and the fields of lilies. Do you think it's angels come to help us? Because if it is, miss, I think I'd better get back to church right quick to say my thanks. That's a nice thing to do, whether it's angels or fairies or something else. But let us not try too hard to solve the riddle. If it is fairies, they may disappear if we try to catch them. Elsewhere. Others were still unaware of the magic, but not blind to its effects. Sarah Crewe looks quite unusual lately. Absolutely fattening, I'd say. Don't know how she's done it, considering. Don't be ridiculous. She has always had plenty to eat. I have provided for her out of my own generosity. As you say, ma'am. There is something very disagreeable in seeing that sort of thing in a child her age. It might almost be called defiance. I heard a story among the girls once, about that Sarah, and her saying what might happen if people find out she were really a princess. Rubbish. Don't talk nonsense. I don't know why I'm speaking to you anyway. Get back to your work. Yes, ma'am. At the beginning of the next week, a man knocked on the door of Miss Minchin's school. When Sarah was sent to answer, she found no one there, only a selection of parcels. She laid the two largest parcels on the hall table and was looking at the address when Miss Minchin came down the stairs and saw her. Take the things to the young lady to whom they belong. Don't stand there staring at them. They belong to me. To you? What are you talking about? I don't know where they came from, but they are addressed to the little girl in the right-hand attic. That is where I see. Becky has the other one. Open them at once. Sarah did as she was commanded. Inside the package was pretty and comfortable clothing, dresses, shoes, stockings and gloves, and a beautiful coat. There was even a nice hat and an umbrella. They were all good and expensive things, and on the pocket of the coat was pinned a paper on which were written these words to be worn every day, will be replaced by others when necessary. Miss Minchin was quite agitated. Sarah, dear, is it possible that you do have relatives living in this country? An uncle or cousin of your father's, perhaps? None that I've ever known. Papa never told me anything about family in England. Well, someone is very kind to you. Sarah could not know what thoughts were racing behind Miss Minchin's eyes, but the change in her voice was clear. As the things have been sent, and you are to have new ones when they are worn out, you may as well go and put them on and look perspectable. After you are dressed, you may come downstairs and learn your lessons in the schoolroom. You need not go out on any more errands today. I am to be a student again? It doesn't seem real. <laughs> oh, God. The game is like lapped itself and now we're back to okay week 38 I don't know I guess we'll just do all the things
Inside, in the afternoon, Sarah and Becky sat together on Sarah's new couch in the beautiful attic hideaway. No one else had yet been invited to view the changes, but every student had seen Sarah in her fine new clothes, sitting back in her old place of honor in the schoolroom. I am not sure who I am anymore. Are you making something up in your head, miss? What? When you stare at the coals like that, all dreaming like, it usually means you're making a new story. Not this time. I am wondering what I ought to do. It seems like it can't be fairies now that other people have seen the magic happening. Miss Vinton thinks I might have relatives that I don't know about. Well, if you don't know, you wouldn't know, would you, miss? But there is a real person who is doing all this for me. Then somehow or other I must find out who it is so I can thank them. Isn't that so? It seems so, miss. But you don't know where they're at. They sure know where you are. Seems if they wanted to talk to you, they could go ahead and do it. Maybe it's a riddle that I meant to solve. With magic there is always a challenge. I hope I will think of something soon. For now, if you sit still, I will get one of the new books and read it to you. What was that? Something's there, miss. It was a strange little sound, like a soft scratching. It sounds rather like a cat trying to get in. Sarah climbed up to peer out of the skylight. Oh, it is Sharon! He has crept out of the Lascar's attic again and he saw our light. Are you going to let him in, miss? Yes, of course. It's too cold for monkeys to be out. They're delicate. I'll coax him in. She sp opened the skylight and spoke to the monkey in soft, coaxing tones, the same as she would use on a sparrow or a rat or even Miss Minchin's cat Tybalt. After a moment's hesitation, the creature seemed grateful for the invitation to warmth. He hopped through the skylight and ran through the room in a great circle, even climbing over Becky's lap. Oh, his tail tickles! After his initial exploration, the monkey curled up in a heap on a soft blanket and fell fast asleep. Poor little thing. I wonder how long he was out there. What should you do with him? We don't have proper food or water for him here. I will have to carry him next door to his owners. I hope he stays asleep. I am not sure how Miss Minton would react if a monkey were running loose in her school. In the house next door, the monkey's absence had not yet been noted. Mr. Carrisford, himself still an invalid, was once again entertaining a visitor. What news? Did you find the child the Russian couple adopted? Her name is Emily Carew. She is much younger than Captain Crewe's little girl. I have seen and talked to her. She is not the child we are looking for. Then the search has to be begun all over again. Come, come. We'll find her yet. We'll go to France together. Paris, of course, but we might also consider Bordeaux. The climate there will be kinder to you this season. Yes, we must begin at once. No time should be lost, and yet... You seem reluctant. We could survey the schools of London if you wish to remain longer. You might have been wrong about France. Many British officers send their offspring here. No. There is a child in London who interests me, but she is not a student, a poor little serving drudge in the house next door. Ram Das told me of the child's miseries, and together we invented a romantic plan to aid her. It gave us something to plan and think about in these long, dark days while you have been gone. Since I could not find the child we sought, I could at least bring comfort to some other parentless soul. If we do leave for France, I must consider what to do for that child. It would be a cruelty to abandon her now. A child without family? Perhaps you should bring her with you. She might prove a companion for Crew's child if you find her. No, no, it would be unkind to pluck a little London girl from her home and spirit her off to another country, where she knows no one and does not speak the language. She does not even know me. We have never met. I have played the mysterious benefactor changing her life from a distance. If Ram Dass were not so agile and soft-footed, it would not have been possible. He has crept into the child's very bedroom unheard to deliver her our gifts. Ah, here is the man himself. Ram Dass salaamed respectfully, but with a touch of excitement in his eyes. Sahib, the child herself has come, the child whom we have discussed. She brings back Sharon, who again ran away to her attic under the roof. I have asked that she remain. It was my thought that it would please you to see and speak with her. 
if your strength is sufficient for a visit. Yes, I think I should like to see her this once. Only once, Sahi? It would do the child no kindness to befriend her now, only to abandon her at once. Carmichael has returned from his journey without success. As soon as possible, we must embark for France to continue the search. You are not yet recovered. I will not allow excuses to hold me back from doing what must be done. I will go at once. I must. Ah, but that has nothing to do with this child. Please go and bring her in. As Ramdas left the room, he turned to Carmichael with a sad little smile. You see, that is another reason I cannot bring the girl with me to Paris. I fear it might be too tempting to see her as a substitute for the child I have not yet found. I will leave some funds and trust for her with a solicitor and wish her well, and that will be an end to it. She will never know. Then Sarah came into the room, carrying the monkey in her arms. He had awakened, and evidently he did not intend to part from her if it could be helped. He was clinging to her and chattering, in the interesting excitement of finding herself in the Italian, in the Indian gentleman's room had brought a flush to Sarah's cheeks. Your monkey ran away to, again. He came to my window, and I let him in because it was so cold. That was very thoughtful of you. Shall I give him to the Lascar now? How do you know he is a Lascar? Oh, I know Lascars. I was born in India. The Indian gentleman sat upright so suddenly, and with such a change of expression, that she was for a moment quite startled. The monkey escaped from her grasp and off to the Lascar's arms. Born in India. Come here, child. Sarah went to him and laid her hand in his, as he seemed to want to take it. You live next door, at Miss Minchin's seminary, a school. But you are not one of her pupils? I don't think I know exactly what I am. At first I was a pupil and a parlor boarder, but now I sleep in the attic next to the scullery maid. He raised her hand in his, eyes wide, and then turned away. Question her, Carmichael. I cannot. What is this about? Mr. Carmichael laid his hands on Sarah's shoulders and gently guided her a few steps away from the fragile man. He stooped a bit, lowering his eyes to her level, and spoke soothingly. What is your name, my dear? Sarah? What do you mean that you were a pupil at first, Sarah? When I was first taken there by my papa. But he died. He lost all his money and there was none left for me. There was no one to take care of me or to pay Miss Minchin. How did your father lose his money? He did not lose it himself. He had a friend he was very fond of. It was his friend who took his money. He loved his friend too much. He trusted him. He should not. Now came the quavering voice of the invalid gentleman. Per perhaps, perhaps the friend might not have meant to do harm. It might have happened through a mistake. Sarah's response was solemn. It did not matter for my papa. The shock of it killed him. What was your father's name, child? His name was Ralph Crew, Captain Crew. He died in India. Ah, oh, it is the child, the child. His eyes bulged in his head and he went quite pale before exploding in a fit of coughing. coughing. Tom! The Lascar ran to his side at once while the other gentleman looked away and cleared his throat. Yes, well, Ram Dass is a devoted servant. Sarah could not understand his words, overwhelmed as she was with the strength of the Indian gentleman's reaction. It seemed for a moment as if he might die right there in front of her. Ram Dass, the Lascar, poured out drops from a bottle into a snifter and held it to his master's lips while soothing his trembling shoulders. With the two of them so evidently occupied, Sarah turned in confusion to the other man in the room. What, what child am I? Mr. Carrisford was your father's friend, Sarah. Don't be afraid. We have been looking for you. For me? Then he was the one who lost my papa's money. He only thought that he had lost it. It was a mistake. But he believed it was true. And because he loved your father so much, his grief made him so ill that he was not in his right mind. He almost died of brain fever, and long before he began to recover, your poor papa was dead. 
He did not know where to find you. We believed you were in school in France or in Russia. We have been searching the world for you. And I was so near. Ram Dass clapped his master's shoulder in a gesture of support. Mr. Carrisford looked calmer now, leaning back in his chair and breathing freely, though still pale. I did not guess. Nor did I dream that you were his friend's poor child. I saw only that you were a little girl who was kind to others and was not treated with kindness. Rum told me how he saw you go by on your errands, looking so sad and neglected, how you slept in a cold and joyless garret. We wished to make you happier. And so I climbed through your windows to bring you gifts and try to make you comfortable. Sarah's face lit. She walked up to Ram Das and Mr. Carrisford, her hands clapped to her breast. You sent the things to me, the beautiful things. It is you who are my friends. And with that, there were many tears and embraces. You have your father's sweet face, but those eyes must be your mother's. They are mine. People often say they are strange, so they must not look like my mother's because she was beautiful. Ram Dass chuckled deeply at her words. Little one. Many things can be both strange and beautiful. Oh. Mr. Carmichael stepped in now to turn matters back to the practical. Sarah, now that we have found you, we wish to begin plans for your future. Your father's share of the diamonds will be yours, but for now you may wish to complete your schooling. She is not to return to that seminary. They have abused and mistreated her quite enough. I need not go back. I am glad. Carmichael, go and speak to this Miss Minchin. She will be very angry. She does not like me, though perhaps it is my fault, because I do not like her. However, there is someone special that must be told. At this point, there came a knock upon the door. It seems that Carmichael would be spared the trip, for the visitor at the door was none other than Miss Minchin herself. I am very sorry to disturb you, Mr. Carrisford, but I have explanations to make. I am the proprietress of the select seminary for young ladies next door. I have come here as a matter of duty. I have just discovered that you have been intruded upon through the forwardness of one of my pupils, a charity pupil who intruded without my knowledge. She turned upon Sarah. Go home at once. You will be severely punished for this. Both Ram Dass and Mr. Carrisford each laid a protective hand on one of Sarah's shoulders. She is not going. Her home for the future shall be with us. With you? That is most... Mr. Carrisford, madam, was an intimate friend of the late Captain Crewe. He was his partner in certain large investments. The fortune which Miss Captain Crewe supposed he had lost has been recovered. Sarah's fortune! Certain events have increased it enormously. The diamond mines have retrieved themselves. There are not many princesses, Miss Minchin, who are richer than your little charity pupil will be. I... I guess she looked back and forth between the members of the room as if expecting someone to admit to the jest, but no such explanation was forthcoming. The muscles in her neck tightened visibly as she swallowed. I see... That is most fortunate for her. Until now, I have been forced to do everything for her out of my own pocket, but for me, she should have starved in the streets. She might have starved more comfortably there than in your attic. I maintain a school of many pupils. I cannot keep them all in comfort without funds. But now, if she can pay for her schooling as the others do, I would be very pleased to keep her. If Sarah herself wishes to return to you, I dare say Mr. Carrisford might not refuse to allow it, but that rest with Sarah. This requirement to plead for Sarah's acceptance clearly did not sit well with the woman, but she would not give up so easily. Dear Sarah, I have not spoiled you, perhaps, but you know that your papa was pleased with your progress at my seminary, and I have always been fond of you. Have you, Miss Minchin? I did not know that. We used to take tea together, do you recall? I have always had your best interest at heart. I have even allowed you to continue your education when you were unable to pay. 
If you return, all can be as it was. Sarah's green eyes fixed on her with a quiet, determined look. You know why I will not go home with you. You know quite well. Have you no gratitude? Are you completely heartless? I am very grateful for the good friends that have sustained me when I was in need, but you have never been my friend. I do not wish for any harm to come to you. I do not want to hurt you as you have hurt me, but I will never belong to you again. Miss Minchin flinched, though she held herself proudly. Perhaps she did the best she could. She did give me a place to sleep and books to read. She was not kind, but she was not deliberately vicious most of the time. That is not enough. I will not allow obligation or forced gratitude to put me in a position where she can hurt me again. I am free now. I will have a new life. Oh, okay, now we get to see the Jesse ending. Yes! Sarah! Sarah! Jessie came running out of Miss Minchin's seminary, her hair flying like a banner behind her. She caught up Sarah's hands and kissed them with enthusiasm. Oh, Sarah, the news is all over the school. You are found and you have diamonds again and Miss Minchin cannot hurt you anymore. You always were a little princess after all. She threw her arms around Sarah, hugging her tightly. I'm so happy for you. Sarah laughed. Aren't you even going to ask? Ask? I thought you wanted to become my companion and travel the world. Now that I'm rich again, it's all possible. Jessie let go of Sarah then, her face twisting in dismay. I do. I want that more than anything else in the world, but I don't deserve it. I hurt you. I laughed at you because she wanted me to. I'm nothing more than Lavinia's lapdog. You did not mean to hurt me, did you? Does that matter? It matters very much to me. She reached out to clasp Jessie's hand. You are happy for me, aren't you? Even before any question of yourself, you want me to be well, and I want you to be well to be free and to dance when you choose and love whom you choose, to give your heart. And here Sarah paused, suddenly unsure. Jessie, did you tell Lavinia that you had given me your locket? No, she asked, she saw that it was missing. I told her that I threw it in the river. I know it's wrong to lie, but I didn't want her to be angry with you. It seems you are not a very good liar. What? Lavinia knew it was false. She told Miss Minchin that I stole the locket from her, and Miss Minchin took it away. Oh no! I'm sorry. I meant to keep your heart safe, but I lost it. I don't know where it is now. Miss Minchin might have it, or she might have given it to Lavinia. It, it doesn't matter. It wasn't worth much. That isn't true. Your heart, your dreams are precious to me. Don't you see that? I... You wanted to believe in me and in miracles, even when my own spirits were so low. And now everything that we dreamed can be true. I will get your locket back. Miss Minchin won't dare to keep it from us now. And I will write to your family. I will give them more than Mr. Watney can offer, so you can come and be my companion as long as that is still your wish. Oh, Sarah! Tears glittered in Jessie's eyes and she brushed them away with the back of her hand. Lavie will be so jealous, she will pull her own hair out by the roots. She paused at that thought, her fingers drawing against her abundant tresses. If, if I am to live with you, then what do you wish me to do with my hair? To cut it or leave it long. I will do anything you wish. Your hair is beautiful, but it is your hair, and you who should be happy with it. I thought that you wanted it to be shorter, so that it would not be in your way when you are dancing. You said that once. But what if you should like me less with shorter hair? You would be every bit as dear to me if you had no hair at all. I would never do such a thing. 
They laughed and embraced and swore to each other that they would travel the world for the love of art and live happily ever after. Okay, that was a good ending. I am emotionally wrecked. <laughs> that was like three and a half hours. <laughs> but we broke it into two videos. That was good. I feel like Hanako did an amazing job of taking the source material and making something that was true to it. But, you know, obviously with differences. Um... I caught some some suggestion that Ram Das and um, Carisford might be lovers, which normally I would be all over because yay, I love gay couples in fiction. Um, but there's that servant dynamic, which I don't, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with master servant romances because there's a huge power imbalance there and it's you know i don't know if if, if he's a quote-unquote servant like lavinia is our quote-unquote companion and it's all just an arrangement or or what so i i don't want to think too hard about that and make myself unhappy but i was just gonna acknowledge it because it's there so um so that's a thing but overall i, I really did enjoy I really did enjoy that. Oh, there's that picture. That Jessie's um, plot line, you know, had her outright say that, that she doesn't like men. I, I'm all about queer representation in 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 my fiction. <laughs> like, let's have more of that. I don't know if she's lesbian. She honestly sometimes kind of read to me as asexual but not aromantic um where you know like like, like still romantic uh, because you know here she wants to have this life with 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 sarah and kissing but not necessarily sex and i think that would be awesome too because you don't get a lot of um asexual romantics in in fiction either so you know that's that's another facet of queer representation, and and also also I think that would be really sweet and cute because I don't know how much I ship her and Sarah as lovers. I mean, obviously they're like twelve or fourteen or whatever, but even growing up, it didn't always seem like like necessarily their their personalities meshed in a passion sort of way. Um, you know, obviously they're both very fond of each other, but they also are very different people that didn't always kind of sync up mentally. Um, but I can totally see like a a, a, a friendly non-sexual romance for, for forever. And I think that would be cool too. Um, although again, it, it's, it's impossible to really project because these are like little kids and I would have been okay with the game aging them up a little bit, but whatever. It feels weird to ship 12 year olds, but I mean, eventually down the line when they're adults, like Harry Potter epilogue adults. Um, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm so tired. <laughs> it's been like three and a half hours of recording, so all of this is probably incoherent gibberish. Um, it was a good game. I really liked it. Uh, I don't know how much I want to play through for the other stuff in terms of the other endings because on the one hand I love everybody and I do totally want to see like a Lavinia ending. God, what would that be like? Um, or a Marietta and Marietta ending or a, a, a Becky ending. I felt so bad that we kind of abandoned Becky there. I like to think that even with the Jesse ending, we still hire Becky because there's no way we would leave her behind. That would be wrong. Um, so, so I do kind of want to go see all the endings, but I don't know if I want to read them all out loud. And I don't know if you guys want this. Uh, I, 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 you let me know if you're interested in this game past, uh, past this happy ending, um, because you might not be. Uh, and I've got plenty of other games that I could also play 
for for you with you um at you <laughs> um god thank you thank you for surviving to the end of this two and a half hour long video i'm sorry it took so long um i had no clue where to cut or how to cut it up and that was probably my own fault for not playing ahead but then you don't get the same reactions so so it's a it's a conundrum um but thank you all you're wonderful lovely wonderful people <laughs> and i will see you in the next video which i don't know what it'll be maybe it'll be another long live the queen i know everybody wants me to to do one of those i'm i'm looking up walkthroughs for them so um once again this has been A Little Lily Princess. It is by Hanukkah Games, who are wonderful people. Um, and my name is Anna Mardal. And I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.